Hey, everybody. We are live at the Pace Studio right now with Jake Brennan. Jake, thank you for being here. Great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Jake has authored this outstanding book, which I uh, uh, am about a couple pages away from finishing. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, nearing the end of the Phil Spector story right now, and it's awesome. Uh, you're also the host of a podcast by the same name, which is doing very well on uh, the internet is where that is found. So. Tell them the name, man. Disgraceland. There we go. Wait, have I, did I not say that? I didn't hear it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Disgraceland is the name of this book. It rules. Disgraceland podcast host and author, Jake Brennan. Dude, thanks for doing this, man. Psyched to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're going to do a segment about Chuck Berry today. Mm -hmm. um, an overview of this book in case, I mean, this name is pretty descriptive about what this book is. Mm. It's, uh, I mean, I love misbehavior personally i love stories of other people behaving badly and that is what this is it's rock stars just being dicks <laughs> and uh and so we're gonna get into chuck berry being a creep yeah. right now i think yeah um, we are yeah um there's a lot of stories in here about lots of different rock stars and the motivation behind their behavior the chuck berry one's particularly compelling to me uh so here's uh here's a little bit from the chuck berry chapter chapter six Chuck Berry couldn't sleep, not on his government-issued mattress anyway, not in the 15-by-15-foot cell with the two other prisoners he was forced to shack up with, and not without sex. Horny wasn't strong enough a word. Chuck Berry was driven to distraction. Who thought it wise to staff this place with female security officers? There weren't a lot, but hell, one female was one too many. And these women were easy on the eyes. Long hair, heels, curves for days... Chuck knew he was in trouble, so he wrote. Chuck Berry loved words, the way they showed up for him and then rolled off his tongue and out onto the page. First as poetry, then later in life as songs, and behind bars he wrote both. The aptly titled No Particular Place to Go, Nadine Is It You, Carol and You Never Can Tell, were among the songs Chuck had written during his second stretch in lockup back in 1962. This current stint was different. He was older, wiser, and had more mileage in the rear view. It was 1979, and Chuck Berry was hellbent on using his time away to write his autobiography and to set the record straight. But the women changed everything. Chuck couldn't focus, keeping his thoughts off sex. The kind of sex that lands you in jail, or keeps you in jail, that was a problem. There was only so much of the mess around he could do by himself. So he wrote what his fellow inmates called Chuck's Good Stories. They were pure sex, bluer than a Red Fox party record. Chuck Berry, America's greatest cultural export since jazz, in an effort to keep himself from spinning off of the planet from a lack of sex in the pen, penned down and dirty fuck fiction. As far as prison was concerned, Charles Edward Anderson Berry, a.k.a. Chuck Berry, a.k.a. the man who invented rock and roll, wasn't really bothered by it. It was the reason he was locked up that bothered him immensely. Sentenced to 120 days for tax evasion in 1979 was bunk. He was guilty, sure. 120 grand or so unreported to Uncle Sam is legit tax evasion, but come on. Des despite previously serving two prison sentences, one a 10-year stint of which he served three for armed robbery at the age of 17, and one for violating the Mann Act, a beef that sent him to the federal pen for a year and a half in 1962 to serve legit hard time, Chuck couldn't help but think that had he not been Chuck Berry, the rock and roller, he would have been given the opportunity to work out a deal with authorities for the relatively harmless white-collar crime he had committed. Chuck knew that the real reason he was in jail was because he was a black man who enjoyed his freedom just a little too freely in a white man's world. But being alone? Nah, it wasn't all that bad. Chuck was used to it. In fact, he preferred it. From an early age, he learned to occupy that big brain of his, first with the family radio, sitting alone as a 12-year-old in his living room at 4319 Labadee Street in St. Louis, Missouri, listening to various jazz, blues, big band, and boogie-woogie artists popular at the time. Ella Fitzgerald, Big Joe Turner, Benny Goodman, Jelly Roll Morton, and Fats Waller were among his favorites. Then with his camera, his friend Harry had a dark room, and Chuck loved it. The solitude, the attention to detail, the way it slowed down the world around him, and of course... The way it sped up his heart rate whenever pinup photos circulated through in need of development. Women, some of them white, in nearly see through lingerie, flirting with him from beyond the lens. Out of the dark room, they were strictly off limits. But here, among the smell of the Eastman Kodak chemicals and within the climate controlled temperature, he could at least speak to them, if nothing else. 
Chuck dug the singular nature of it all. It gave him time to think about the things that teenage boys think about. To think about where he was, who he was, and what he wanted out of his life. And it gave him time to think about poetry. He put poems together in his head to pass the time. And soon he would begin to think about that poetry as music. Being alone was where it was at. It was how Chuck liked it. Even years later, while he was at the height of his success and financially able to employ bands big enough to rival his beloved Count Basie's orchestra, Chuck preferred, no, insisted, on traveling alone. With no band, just him, his guitar, and an open road. He didn't even carry a guitar chord, never mind an amplifier. He'd roll from town to town in one of his late model coffee color Cadillacs, stone alone. No manager, no roadie, no handlers, and no accompanying musicians. At about 30 minutes before showtime, he'd pull up to whatever 10 to 20,000 capacity venue he was headlining that night near the backstage entrance, park wherever the hell he wanted, waltz into the promoter's office confidently, and politely demand payment in advance, in cash, and usually, under the threat of not performing, extort another extra $1,000 cherry on top before going on stage. Once satisfied that the pockets of his polyester bell-bottoms were properly lined, He'd walk on stage with his Gibson ES-335, straight past his backing band, a combo of local musicians he'd yet to meet who stood scared shitless with their instruments readied for the great Chuck Berry's cue. Chuck would then plug his guitar into whatever amp the promoter had set up for him and proceed to tune his guitar loudly in front of the entire auditorium and then, without having said one word or making any eye contact at all with his new band, he'd launch into one of his classic opening riffs and drag the terrified musicians along with him for a clumsy but exhilarating ride. Even on stage, playing with other people in front of thousands of fans, he was alone, in his own head while playing the hits and mugging for the crowd occasionally allowing himself to get lost and tearing the ass out of one of his guitar solos. If he was really feeling it, by mid-set he turned to his band and playfully shout, Play for that money, boys! And if they were lucky and good, he'd kick a grand back to them after the show on top of whatever the promoter was paying. But more often than not, he was gone after the last encore, without a word, usually before the house lights were even on, sometimes before the band had even finished the outro to his last song drifting off down some American highway into the night, words moving through his head in slow motion, his guitar in its case strapped in vertically in the passenger seat to his right. But otherwise, he was totally alone. All right. Dude, thank you. That was, uh, uh, I wanted to talk about about that chapter in particular because we're in this this massive music archive here yeah. and uh, some of the tapes here are uh, Bill Graham archive tapes and there are a lot of Chuck Berry tapes from the Winterland from Fillmore, Fillmore East and uh, the Steve Miller Blues Band was one of those, that was a band that was formed as Chuck Berry's backing band and then evolved into oh, really? the Steve Miller Band. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. That's yeah, crazy. dude, and actually, so I mean the, the real misbehavior behavior of that chapter i mean it's the the spying on women and videotaping women in bathrooms is excuse I, me excuse me alleged ale- uh, right 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 <laughs> yes sure yeah because there was not enough of a mountain of evidence to prove that that had happened well there well, they settled out of court which was um i mean it is i do talk about it in the book it's not why i, I didn't read it it's just so damn filthy that it's it's hard to read in public yeah. at these things well dude so there's three bathrooms in this place as you know i think you use the bruce the bruce springsteen bathroom with that poster in it yeah that's the herbie hancock bathroom right there this is gold record <laughs> the other bathroom has this fucking chuck berry poster <laughs> and so that's the chuck berry bathroom and that's i want the cameras not call it that anymore <laughs> like i was vaguely aware of that story but i've been calling it the chuck berry bathroom for the entire time we've been here and i have to call at the Steve Miller bathroom now yeah. because he was also he's also on that poster. Got it, got it. Yeah, for those who don't know, the uh, Chuck Berry incident you're talking about is there was a there was a court case. There's a case against him filed by the district attorney in St. Louis um, for reportedly setting up video cameras in the restaurant that he owned and filming um, women. And these are hundreds of tapes. Um, by Chuck Berry's own estimation, he had spent seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars at the time on his uh, video equipment hobby. Uh, anyways, that court was settled out of case uh, for, I think, uh, some odd millions of dollars. I yeah, can't 1. remember 2. the exact number. 1.2? Yeah. yeah. I just so. read your book. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, can we talk about your background a little bit? Are you, sure. what was, uh, I mean, these are super compelling stories and I, I intuitively understand the attraction to them, yeah. but what in particular drove you to want to tell these? Are you a musician, a journalist, uh, I'm definitely, a fan of misbehavior? Yeah. Definitely, um, not a journalist. Um, and I, I, I mentioned that in the book, I, I'm very upfront about the fact that, uh, a lot of the work that went into the book is built on the backs of real journalists mm -hmm. who went out and found these stories first. What I do is I'm a storyteller. I'm a podcaster. I go out and find these stories. Um, and then I come up with my own point of view on them and I piece together a story that I find is interesting that might not be part of, or that might not be the way that the history of these artists have been told in the past. I try to tell the history of these artists specifically through the true crime, uh, the crimes and transgre transgressions that they've committed. Uh, to me, that's a far more interesting way to read about these artists. Um, I grew up in the music industry. My wife grew up in the music industry. I've been a professional musician and musician my whole band. I mean, I professional with air quotes. I was in an indie band. Um, and <laughs> I, I mean, I say that as a knock against the, myself, not indie music, but you know. And but you grow up in this world and you hear these stories. That's the point I'm trying to make. You hear hear them sort of backstage and secondhand and and if you do enough research, you can find them out there. They're buried in biographies and autobiographies and in news articles and documentaries. And I also grew up fascinated with true crime, with James Elroy, with reading Dominic Don and Vanity Fair and horror. And I thought, what if I had just mixed music storytelling with true crime storytelling? And if that was my podcast and that's sort of how it came to be. And how much, I think it, the way that you phrased it was that it's a mix of uh, 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 true crime and transgressive fiction, mm -hmm. I think was the, was the phrase that you used. How much of each is it? I mean, I realize that this is all, that it's factual, but like the, the Norwegian black metal mm -hmm. chapter, there's, you know, stuff told from the point of view of a dead person, right. which clearly is um, right. by definition right. speculative. I um, have no passage into eternity, so I cannot report adequately from heaven or hell or wherever <laughs> dead from mayhem resides right now. Um, but yeah, to answer your question directly, it's about a 90-10 split. And I reserve about 10% of the storytelling for creative devices to move the story along in a way that is interesting to me in the same way that a television or movie script writer would, would write something. So my sort of cue was when I started writing this stuff, I was heavily into that television show Narcos Oh yeah, on Pablo Escobar. And, you know, the writers of that show have no idea what Pablo Escobar is voicing to his wife in his private moment or to his, you know, henchmen uh, when he's about to murder a bunch of people, but they need to actually find those words and they need to create those creative devices to move the story along. So um, that's what I do. Interestingly enough, um, you'll appreciate this because of where we are. Um, do you have any Grateful Dead stuff oh, in here? Dude, it's their, those four <clears throat> tapes on top of there, those are all, I think, 1989 New Year's Eve. There's, okay. Yeah, there's tons of Dead in here because Bill Graham, obviously. Right, I mean, it's, right. Yeah, they're probably the most represented artist in Got this it. whole place. Yeah, that makes sense. So I did a Grateful Dead episode on my podcast. And in it, I, I, you know, I knew I was going to take a lot of heat from Deadheads if I didn't talk about the ultra omega acid LSD thing with Owsley and... That's like 10 podcasts in itself right there. Yeah, in the Graham Parsons story too, in the Altamont disaster with, mm -hmm. you know, 100,000 people right. on real good acid. Right, right. So I create, you know, I knew, I knew that story, but I didn't want it, I didn't want that to be the story I wanted to tell. So I created this creative device. It's sort of a mirror image of Owsley. It's a CIA guy and he's sort of Owsley's handler. And I gave him a name and I use him in the episode so that I can fly back to talk about the LSD thing when necessary, but not dedicate the whole trip to it. Um, so I released the episode. It's one of the more popular episodes I've ever done. About a week later, I get an email from Dennis McNally, who's, who wrote The Long Strange Trip, was mm -hmm. the dead's publicist for years, Jerry Garcia's official biographer. And he's like, I've, I, I've read your, your pod, I've heard your podcast, and I agree with a large percentage of what you say. Would you please call me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. So I called him and uh, he was great. And he told me though that um, he and Robert Hunter, Robert Hunter had heard it and they got on the phone and they were like, did this, did this kid figure it out? Because they have their own theories about Owsley and his time um, 
while he was in the military and how he created acid. I'm not going to go into it. That's somebody else's point of view. That's a chemistry podcast. But I was like, uh, no, I didn't figure anything out. <laughs> I just kind of, <laughs> I just kind of invented this thing. So it, that's about, uh, that's a long way of answering your question. It's about a 90, 10 split. And I have fun with that stuff too. It makes it interesting to me. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to me too. I love the book. Um, and, uh, I'm wondering, do you ever intend or have you done this on any of the episodes? Uh, have you ever become, or would you like to be a character in your own thing? Like, have you misbehaved to the extent entertainingly misbehaved and misadventured to the extent that you would be an interesting character uh, on your, in your own creation? I'm definitely a flawed human, but I don't think I'm anywhere near <laughs> as flawed as the people in this book. <laughs> Um, and that's a credit to my parents <laughs> and my wife and kids. So no. Yeah. 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 I mean, you would have to be a, I mean, the Axl Rose chapter comes as a surprise to nobody that the dude is a fucking psycho. And, uh, yeah, you would, you would have to wake up pretty early in the morning to, <laughs> to match that yeah. level of, of insanity. The Axl Rose one is interesting because I don't condone the behavior in this, obviously, I'm a, but I'm also not um, celebrating it and I'm not defending these people. Um, however, I have this belief that the amazing music that these people have made, the first Guns N' Roses record, Live at the Apollo by James Brown, GP by Graham Parsons, you don't get any of that music unless the people who made it had these horrible experiences in their formative years that created them and informed who they were. That same thing that drove Axl Rose to crack a woman over the head with a beer bottle or you know, wine bottle, excuse me, or, or, or caused Graham Parsons to become blotto drunk almost every night of his life and do a ton of heroin and James Brown to go on a crazy shotgun and crack PCP fueled uh, high speed car chase. You don't get that, and you also don't get the great music that they created without um, the stuff that happened to them when they were kids. You know, the death of the suicide of Graham's father, right? Um, Axl Rose being sexually molested when he was two years old, um, and James Brown being hung upside down in a bag at the age of eleven, raised in a whorehouse and beat with pool sticks as a means of discipline. You don't get that, and that's impossible to ignore. That's in these stories as well because it's part of the story. Yeah, well, and I thought that your treatment of the real people to whom really shitty things have happened, your treatment of those real people was fair as well. I mean, there's right at the beginning of the book, even maybe in the foreword, I forget, um, just an acknowledgement of, you know, this is not strictly a piece of entertainment to be chuckled at. And these things happen to people who were hurt very deeply and in many cases killed by by all this uh, misadventure. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's real human collateral damage that happens. People are dead. Families have been destroyed. Um, careers have been completely completely blown up and you can't ignore that. And, but oftentimes we do. So yeah, it's at the author's note in the beginning of my book. I say it up front because, you know, ultimately I'm trying to write an interesting and entertaining book and I'm an entertaining podcast, but that's part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I stayed in the room that Graham Parsons overdosed. I, I did too, in, man. in room eight at the Joshua yes, Tree Motel yes. and then the Amy Lou Harris room seven the next night because the Graham Parsons room is booked like way in advance yeah. and we only got one night uh, of availability. It's a, uh, it's a, I mean, I don't believe in that much metaphysical sort of shit, but there, there's a, it's heavy. a vibe did about you go to that Cap place. Rock as well. Yeah. Um, no, 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 we didn't. Where, no. where the, was that the site of the burning? Yeah. 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 No. I talked to Kaufman for the book actually. Yeah. Phil Kaufman. Yeah. Dude, I, that I think that's my favorite chapter in the book because I was aware, pretty well aware of that story. I did not realize. Yeah, I don't want to give away all the details. I mean, it's all pu there's a, a lot of details. Public Go record, ahead. but it's, <laughs> dude, it's so good. The fact that a cop helped <laughs> helped them to steal the body. I know that's insane. unknowingly, but that's it's insane. dude, it's so good. Um, that's a good buddy, man. Sneaking yeah. into LAX to steal a body, <laughs> yeah. steal a hearse, and get wasted first, and then get wasted, and then light that motherfucker on fire. Like that's a buddy. That is a buddy. I like that's that a good a friend. Lot, dude. I like Phil Coffin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you think of any public figures, uh, musicians out there right now who you hope to find out 
misbehave regularly and like surprising ones, <laughs> ones that you just hope are doing something fucked up behind closed doors and that you are yearning to do a podcast about. Oh man. I don't, I don't, well, first of all, I don't wish this behavior on anyone. Okay. <laughs> like, come on, man. It's like hoping it'll rain. Like, um, it's nice when it rains. Uh, <laughs> it's like hoping for a typhoon, I should say, but I, I can't wait for this R Kelly thing to be resolved. Cause there's obviously a story there yeah. that I'd like to tell. And, uh, it seems like every time I go to Los Angeles, someone else is whispering something to me about Michael Jackson, but who the hell knows what's real and what's not. But the R Kelly thing for sure, because it's just batshit crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what can we, so you're in the middle of season four of mm -hmm. Disgraceland, the podcast right now. Um, are there, what can we expect from season four? Are they, do you announce the guests just as soon as it goes live or do we know, is it public knowledge? What's, yeah, I announce the subjects up? in advance. So we're about halfway through. We launched episode five today. It was on Iggy Pop. I think it's my favorite. Oh shit. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, Iggy Pop reel sitting right there, right. by the way. Right. I think it's my favorite episode. Um, and then we have also, we have episodes coming on Madonna, uh, which I'm really excited about. Um, a two-parter that I'm writing right now on Dennis Wilson uh, that deals with not just Charles Manson, that's well-explored territory, but the period um, right after the Sharon Tate and LaBianca murders, but before they had actually found out who did it and the paranoia that gripped Los Angeles and Hollywood at the time. That's a two-parter that we're going to close with. Um, and another one on ASAP Rocky as well. Okay. And Whitney Houston. I think that does season four. Did not expect ASAP Rocky to be uh, to be among that list of names, but yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, did you see Once Upon a Time in I Hollywood? I did. I watched it again for the third time two nights ago. Yeah. yeah I was playing that in the was hotel. Real good. I, was I knew nothing about it before I went and watched, and I'm glad that I went in with no expectations and had no idea what I was walking into, I and I it. really liked it. Yeah, so good. Yeah. yeah. Well, dude, thanks for coming and doing this. Thanks Appreciate for having it me. very much. Appreciate Land is the book. It's out everywhere where books are sold, and uh, it's great. I hope that you, the internet, check it out. It's it's outstanding. And uh, dude, thanks again for coming and doing it. And uh, that's all I got. We're all done. right. Thanks. All thanks, right. everyone. Take care. <laughs>